Today is August 14th, 2013. I'm here with Kevin O'Neill at the Cleveland Marshall College of Law at Cleveland State University in Cleveland, Ohio. Kevin acted as ACLU of Ohio legal director from 1991 to 1995 and served as a volunteer attorney both before and after his time as legal director. Your interviewer today is Emily Wicks, history associate for the ACLU of Ohio. Kevin, thank you for being here with me today. It's my pleasure. Okay, let's start out with some background questions. Where and when were you born? Uh, 1955, uh, here in Cleveland. Uh, I grew up on the east side. And can you describe your family and your childhood a little bit? Yeah, I had two brothers, no sisters. Uh, I was the oldest of three. We were pretty well bunched together in terms of our ages, so we were always able to serve as playmates uh, throughout the course of our time together. Uh, my dad was a lawyer and my mom was a stay-at-home mom. And uh, we didn't move. Um, from the time I was in second grade, we stayed in the same house. My parents are still in that house now. I wound up going to Cleveland Heights High School and graduating in, in 1973. Do you think your um, father being a lawyer influenced your desire to become a lawyer? You know, I'll tell you, it, it not, not, at least at the time, it, it was not something that uh, I was inspired to do. It took many, many years and some uh, experiences that I had in my early 20s before I was sort of turned in the, in the direction of the law, but not initially, no. So then where did you attend college and what was your major? Well, I, I was a film major, uh, and I went to San Francisco State University, uh, graduated there in 1977. Uh, at that time, there were only two colleges in the whole country where you could get an undergraduate major in film. One was NYU, and I wasn't smart enough to get in there, and the other was San Francisco State. The two Los Angeles schools, uh, USC and UCLA, only offered film as a graduate course of study, which I now think is, is a much better idea. I think, in retrospect, I think it was a mistake to be a film major because uh, film is a medium of expression. And, you know, when you're, I went off to college when I was 17 years old, didn't really have all that much to say. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I think it's probably better to study film as a graduate course of study after you've had a, a, a more substantial major. So after receiving your BA in film, you worked on the editorial staff of the Los Angeles Herald Examiner. How did your degree in film or the time with the newspaper inform your later activities with the ACLU of Ohio? Well, what, what happened was that I, I started out giving tours at Universal Studios, uh, and that wound up actually being a, a, a very good preparation for my teaching years because I gave uh, two or three times a day, I had to give a two and a half hour okay. tour to people anywhere from 60 to 75 uh, people. And so it was, and I, I was not allowed to use any notes. I had to speak extemporaneously. So I had to commit to memory a gigantic notebook of information about the studio and all the films that have been made there. Uh, so that wound up sort of helping me down the road. Um, I was writing film reviews at that time for a couple of small magazines in Southern California. Um, and ultimately wound up working at the Los Angeles Herald Examiner. And there, that was the experience that began to turn me toward the law because I was uh, placed in the newsroom and uh, started out at the very bottom of the rung, but got to see the reporters working, got to see the editors working. And uh, there were very interesting political issues that were occurring in California at that time. This was. I worked there from 1979 to 1981, and so there were some rather tumultuous political events that were occurring. Uh, the, the infamous um, Proposition, I think it was Proposition 13, uh, which was sort of a property tax revolt. Uh, so lots of interesting things happening in both politics and the courts. And in a newsroom, I'm literally sitting there at the sort of epicenter of all of this news activity. And that's what, that's what caused me to think about, um, about law. Although it, what's interesting, my initial interest in the law was not to practice law, but, but to further my journalism career. I hadn't gone to journalism school, and so I wasn't taken very seriously by the editors. On my days off, I would go and interview people and, and write feature stories, and I would submit them, always fruitlessly. Uh, but I noticed that the, the paper began hiring 
young people who had just graduated from law school, people who had gone to Loyola of Los Angeles Law School, and they were being hired right after their graduation to serve as reporters on both politics and the courts. And so I thought, well, if I go to law school, maybe I can use that to go back into journalism and be able to make more of an impact than I'm making right now, which is not, not very much. I mean, the, the most they let me do was to, I, I wrote my own column on consumer affairs, which was you know, good for a kid who was 23, 24 years old, but uh, they, they didn't, didn't let me anywhere near the hard news stuff. So that, that's originally why I went to law school. It wasn't because I wanted to be a trial lawyer. It was because I wanted to further my career in journalism so that I would be qualified to cover politics in the courts. So where did you end up attending law school? Well, I, th I thought I would come back home. Uh, I, got, I got into a couple of the California schools, but my parents began looking rather, f rather feeble and, and vulnerable to me. And so I thought, you know, if I can get into one of the Cleveland schools, I should go back home and, and attend law school there. So I got into Case Western Reserve, and so I went to law school there. And I went there from 81 to 84, got my, got my JD in 1984. I was able to keep an eye on my parents uh, <laughs> at the same time. Um, so do you think your background in journalism helped you later at the ACLU of Ohio when you had to you know, deal with the media? Yeah, I, I think it was incredibly helpful. I, I found that it was easy for me to empathize with reporters, easy for me to understand what their job was so that I could make their job easier. Uh, and I learned that I had to be able to speak in sound bites for the television people, <clears throat> but on radio, I could be more expansive. In those days, this was there was there was a very vibrant uh, local talk radio scene in those days. There were many channels that were devoted to uh, talking at length about local issues. And so, Christine Link, the, the wonderful executive director with whom I was lucky to work. And I, I adore her and had wonderful years with her. Um, we both realized that one way to get the message out for the ACLU was to do a lot of local talk radio. And it was in radio where we could speak more expansively about uh, our, 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 well, the, the cases we were working on and the policies that we were developing. Uh, but I think those, those pivotal years at the Los Angeles Herald Examiner caused me to be able to express myself in a way that was helpful and useful and quotable for uh, for journalists. I remember um, even in the in the little column that I wrote on consumer affairs, um, th there were there were <laughs> when I think about the editors, the the people that I work for. I mean, uh, I, I learned to write there. Basically, there there were there were. There were editors who were smoking cigars at 10 o'clock in the morning who would bite your head off if you submitted uh, any piece of writing that didn't have a beautifully constructed lead paragraph. They, they would just bite your head off. Uh, these were tough people, and they scared the hell out of me, frankly, and it was through fear that I learned uh, how to write for them. And all those years later for the ACLU, both my writing of, of legal briefs and my ability to speak to the press, they were all formed by, by those experiences at the, at the newspaper. So have you always been interested in civil liberties and equality? You know, frankly, it, it, it took me a while. I was more interested in artistic expression. Um, I was interested in filmmaking, and I was interested in the plastic arts. Um, and what, what actually made the change for me were, were two things. Uh, one of them was the election of Ronald Reagan to the presidency, which horrified me. Um, and that, that occurred in 1980 when I was uh, at the newspaper. Uh, the other thing that really affected me was that my wife, uh, Sonia Winner, uh, who um, is graduated from Cleveland Marshall, this law school, when did she graduate? She graduated, um, must have been a couple of years before I took the ACLU job. So I started at ACLU in 1991. She was a law clerk at the ACLU. I'm working at a big firm, and we both come home, and she's working on all the interesting stuff, you know. Uh, I'll never forget 
how this must have been as early as 1989 or 1990. Um, Sonia was working for Gordon Beggs uh, at the ACLU when they were on West 6th Street. And Sonia would come home, uh, and I, I still remember some of the cases she was working on. There was a very interesting challenge that the ACLU brought to the form of the ballot in Ohio. I believe, if I remember correctly, that it would list the Democratic candidate and the Republican candidate, but any other candidates, they would just have their names without any party affiliation. And so they were, you know, to, to the average person voting, they were sort of an unknown quantity. And I believe that the ACLU brought a challenge, but I know that Sani was spent her days researching um, ballots and, and the forms that ballots took historically in Ohio. And I remember thinking, wow, that's interesting stuff. And what an interesting, what an interesting suit to bring. Uh, so she's the one who, who sort of got me really interested in civil liberties. And then I began to go to the monthly meetings of the legal committee. And it was there when I began to hear about some of the civil liberties violations that were occurring in Cleveland that I got interested. Uh, and it was then that I first volunteered to be a volunteer attorney for the ACLU. And I remember the first case I worked on. It was, uh, I think it might have been, it might have involved Fairview Park, but it was, a, it was a municipality that had imposed a total ban on political signs. So you could have for sale signs on, on your yard, but you couldn't put up any sort of political sign. And someone came to the ACLU seeking representation after they had received a ticket for refusing to take a vote for judge so-and-so sign off their lawn. And so I volunteered to take the case and was able to dispose of the case um, using um, a procedural device far in advance of any trial. I was able to write a brief laying out the First Amendment arguments and I persuaded the court to dismiss the charges against the client. And that was, that when, when I won that case, uh, that was, a, that was the, the pivotal moment for me. Because that, that, I, I, I felt so much satisfaction helping that person and fighting an unjust law it completely altered the direction of my life. Um, and uh, it's all thanks to my wife, uh, who, who kind of, you know, pointed the way to me. Um, so that, that's, that's how I got started. That's great. Do you know um, about when that case was or when you became a volunteer attorney? I think I started in 89 or 90, and I'll bet that case was in 90. Uh, you know, I, 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 the first few monthly meetings, I would just listen and try to absorb what was happening. And finally, I was so outraged by that particular fact pattern that I just raised my hand and said, give me that case. I, I want that case. So can you talk about your transition from volunteer attorney to legal director of the ACLU of Ohio? Yeah. That I, basically, uh, the, the four years that I served as legal director for the Ohio ACLU were four of the greatest years of my life. Um, and uh, to have the opportunity to try constitutional cases all over the state uh, to have the ability to be part of the process of selecting which cases we would take and of developing criteria for deciding which cases we should take, that was unbelievably stimulating. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I enjoyed it so much that even after I took my job here as a, as a professor, I continued working on a number of cases uh, that I had started uh, at the ACLU when I was employed there, and I just, you know, I, I, I think um, the homeless dumping case, for example, I don't think that we settled that until 1997, which was two years after I left the ACLU. Um, and then I also served as a volunteer attorney for a couple of cases, most notably the, uh, the so-called last words case, where the state of Ohio tried to take away the right of a, of a condemned prisoner to utter his uh, a dying speech in the seconds before he was executed. That was the one of the most stimulating cases I've, I've ever worked on. Do you recall the name of that case? Treesh versus Taft, and uh, that case uh, was filed in the late 90s, and I believe that we, the, the government finally ceased, and, and therefore we were able to reach a settlement in, I believe, 2001. So what were some hot topics that were being litigated during your time with the ACLU? I think that, well, there was reproductive freedom was very important. Um, also, uh, basic 
First Amendment protection, especially against governmental discrimination against viewpoint or message. Uh, that was important to us. Um, the right to public protest. Uh, and finally, the, uh, the protection of uh, homeless uh, against um, some, some very aggressive uh, efforts to make them disappear, the so-called homeless dumping case, which I'm, which we researched for, we, we did an exhaustive investigation for almost two years before filing suit in, I think, October 1994. Uh, so th those were the those were the key themes. Uh, to go back over those, um, we we filed suit against the state of Ohio um, in 1992, I believe. Uh, for a challenge to a very restrictive abortion uh, statute uh, that uh, uh, required a 48-hour waiting period uh, and also required that uh, the, any woman seeking an abortion had to be presented uh, with essentially propaganda material, the anti-abortion propaganda material, delivered by her doctor but written by the government uh, designed to dissuade her from having an abortion. And so we, we brought that challenge uh, in state court and we used both the federal constitution and the state constitution because we were concerned that Roe versus Wade was about to be overruled. And so we didn't want to place all of our reliance upon federal constitutional law. Uh, we also brought state constitutional claims and so that abortion case caused me and and Chris and, and really the whole organization to begin to take seriously the availability of state constitutional claims as a viable alternative or supplement to federal constitutional claims. Uh, so that that case, we actually obtained an, uh, an injunction against the, the law in the district court after a trial. I was the lead counsel in that case. Uh, we had some very eloquent testimony by doctors and nurses uh, and a lady who ran an abortion clinic and I, I think it was, was very, very persuasive to the trial judge. Uh, and in our victory, the judge actually recognized certain state constitutional claims that we brought. Uh, we, we got a very conservative appellate panel that took our victory away from us. The Ohio Supreme Court refused to review it and uh, so did the U.S. Supreme Court. So unfortunately we lost that case. Well, the reason we lost that case was because at the, f at the U.S. Supreme Court level, the Pennsylvania statute, um, which was essentially identical to the Ohio statute, uh, was partly struck down, partly upheld, and so our case had the same fate. So how does this course, or how did this case foreshadow um, some similar issues that might be in today's society? Frankly, I can't believe that we're still fighting about abortion and that we're facing even more restrictive laws. Uh, the law, the, the current law in Ohio is much more restrictive than the one we challenged. The one in Texas is much more restrictive than the one we challenged. Frankly, I, I find it astonishing that women's reproductive freedom is still being threatened uh, here at the dawn of the of the 21st century. Well, are there any other significant cases um, that you worked on at the ACLU of Ohio, and why were they significant? Well, I think the homeless dumping case was important, um, and we we handled a similar case in Columbus. Uh, you know, with uh, it just, you know racial profiling has certainly been in the news with the Trayvon Martin. Um, uh, failure of justice. Uh, and so it's interesting to remember uh, what was happening in the early 90s. Uh, in Columbus, Ohio, there was something called uh, Operation ACE, which was a program in which uh, the police in large numbers and with, with big paddy wagons ready to arrest multiple people would roll into a, a, uh, an African-American neighborhood and every single young black male who was seen out of doors was stopped, questioned, asked to produce identification, frisked, and they would even be arrested for something as minor as jaywalking. And they would throw them into these paddy wagons and drive off. And so they were essentially terrorizing African-American neighborhoods. Uh, so we went down there, uh, investigated, and brought suit. 
And uh, in a case called Glass versus City of Columbus, we managed to get a, a good settlement that essentially brought Operation Ace to a halt. Um, up in Cleveland, uh, a similar kind of case involving the homeless was Clements versus City of Cleveland. That was a case in which the City of Cleveland, under Mike White, uh, simply was trying to make the homeless population disappear by moving them, physically taking them out of the downtown area and dumping them. Uh, and so that's what we call it, the, the homeless dumping case. There was a special van, van number 399, uh, that was the principal vehicle, but there were uh, squad cars used for this purpose as well. And basically the city targeted uh, the warehouse district, the downtown business district, and the flats at a time when the flats was a little more popular than it is right now. And any people who didn't pass the dress code, who basically looked like they were homeless, were approached and were not given the choice of whether they would go into the van. They were herded into the van and they were driven to the outskirts of town, always far away from any bus line or rapid transit line, and unceremoniously dropped off. So they weren't accused of a crime. They weren't booked uh, in, in, a, in a police station. They were taken away from the city and dumped. And when these guys would venture back downtown, people like Mr. Clements, who in his own quiet uh, way were unbelievably brave, he would just keep coming downtown and they would keep taking him farther and farther out. So Mr. Clements was once dropped off at the Brexville Metro Park in the winter uh, with no way of getting back. And so that's the, that's the kind of stuff that was going on. Um, so we investigate. We couldn't quite believe it uh, when we were first hearing rumors of this. But I began uh, interviewing homeless people uh, in churches and at shelters, and all of them said that it was going on. Uh, all I mean, there was no one said that this wasn't happening. Most of these people said that it happened to them. Um, and so we began interviewing people. The problem in having clientele who are homeless is that it's hard to find them again. And this was in a day and age before cell phones, when these folks wouldn't, wouldn't have been able to have cell phones anyway. Uh, but, but in those days, if you wanted to talk to your homeless client, you had to go outside and find them, you know. Um, and uh, some of these guys would sort of be in, in the same general vicinity. Uh, but if they weren't, you just weren't able to talk to them. So I made an arrangement with them. They would always come to my office um, on Friday afternoons. And eventually we had a core of about four guys who consistently came to my office every Friday afternoon. And, those, and they all agreed to be named plaintiffs, not John Doe plaintiffs, named plaintiffs. Uh, and so finally, we, we, we sent a demand letter to the city of Cleveland. They refused to acknowledge that they were dumping. And so we brought suit in October of 1994, I believe. And uh, then there was a huge straw. And as soon as we filed that lawsuit, the dumping stopped. <laughs> but they wouldn't acknowledge that they were doing it. Uh, they wouldn't cooperate with discovery. We had to ask again and again and again for the, the judge to order them to turn over documents. They wouldn't, uh, so we were able to work out an arrangement where Gary Daniels, who is now in, in Columbus, good old Gary Daniels, who was, uh, uh, was a legal assistant uh, back in 95, I guess, when he and I did this. And we spent a summer over at the, I think it's the third district police headquarters. Um, they wouldn't let us use their copier, so he and I had to carry a copier up two flights of stairs. And there was a hallway of file cabinets, and they said, go ahead, you know go through them. And what we did was we were looking for duty reports. Every single police officer, every single day that he or she works, has to fill out a one-page form that identifies everything that they did during the course of their shift. And we began to notice for van number 399, if we could find a van number 399 um, document, we began to see the names of our clients. Mr. Clements was uh, <laughs> materialized a number of times. So we made copies of these, and these documents served to essentially corroborate the rather incredible stories that the homeless guys were, were telling us. Um, what, what I think caused the case to turn in our favor was that finally 
because of the publicity, uh, a number of, of non-homeless people came forward. So the problem with our case was that all of our witnesses were homeless, but we actually got some people who were not members of the homeless population to come forward and they had seen people either picked up or dropped off. And so once we had these additional witnesses, uh, the judge allowed me, finally, granted me the uh, the ability to take the deposition of the mayor. As soon as we got that order, the city settled within 48 hours. That's great, all that hard work paid off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know what, it was wonderful because we got a settlement for the, our four guys. First of all, we stopped, the, we stopped the dumping program. Second, each of our four guys got his um, money for an apartment for one year uh, plus the, secu the security deposit. And so they were all able to lift themselves out of homelessness and get jobs. And uh, one of our clients, Mr. Mungai, still comes and sees me. I think Mr. Clements, last I heard, is doing construction work in Florida. I hope he's making more money than I am. I'd, I'd be delighted by that. But Mr. Mungai still comes and sees me. He came yesterday. Oh, wow, that's great. And uh, so he's, he's driving a cab now, in fact. Wow. Uh, so he's doing okay. He has his own apartment. And um, so it's it's nice so that it, it looks like like everything turned out well yeah well another case that kind of related to that issue of mistreatment of the homeless uh, was northeast ohio coalition for the homeless um, versus city of cleveland can you talk about that case yeah that was a licensing case uh there the city that that one still really irks me uh because uh, i was able to get an injunction in the district court uh, but then the sixth circuit uh, overturned it and this in the u.s supreme court denied cert uh, so we do, were able to and well, well i should describe what happened uh, uh, in their continuing war on the homeless and also on other sort of unpopular minority groups uh, the city of cleveland began to require a fifty dollar per head license fee for uh, homeless or Nation of Islam uh, street newspaper vendors to sell their newspapers on the sidewalk. And uh, for, for a homeless person, $50, to, to pay a $50 license fee was like asking him to buy a Learjet. I mean, it was just not going to be able to happen. And frankly, um, the same thing was true with uh, the, the, the Nation of Islam uh, newspaper uh, vendors. I mean, they, those guys look fabulous. They always are wearing a suit and they look like a million bucks, but they, they're not uh, exactly rolling in, in, in money either. And so the $50 fee for each one of them was almost insuperable. And so we brought a constitutional challenge to that license fee and we managed to get a federal district court judge, I believe it was Judge, good old Judge Aldrich, uh, she granted us an injunction blocking uh, the enforcement of that fee. Uh, but then once again, we get to the Sixth Circuit, we have a, a very conservative, there's a Reagan appointee, uh, one or two Reagan appointees on the panel, and they ruled against us. Uh, and then I wrote a cert petition to the U.S. Supreme Court that the national ACLU looked at and said, O'Neill, you're in. You're, you're, you're going to get to argue this case in the Supreme Court, but the Supreme Court uh, denied cert. Fortunately, um, even though we didn't win on the merits, the city ultimately agreed to stop enforcing that license fee against the homeless uh, because it was just so, so utterly unfair. Um, and so I, I believe they, they agreed to stop enforcing it against both the homeless and the Nation of Islam. So even though we lost the case, even the city acknowledged that it was out of bounds to, to do what it was doing, and it, it, it voluntarily stopped. Okay. Um, so you mentioned uh, that one of the major hot topics was First Amendment rights. Uh, can you talk about some other cases that you litigated that dealt with First Amendment rights? Yeah, uh, once again, you know, back to unpopular groups and uh, the government discriminating against them. Uh, once again, the Nation of Islam and its very controversial leader, Louis Farrakhan. Uh, Louis Farrakhan was scheduled to give uh, um, a, a speech uh, in, in public hall, and uh, the city of Cleveland refused to allow him to rent the hall. And in doing so, they treated him differently than the Billy Graham crusade, which they allowed uh, to rent the hall. Let me explain the, the background. 
uh, the nation of Islam, you know, when you look at the way they deal with the family, are very conservative. Uh, they believe that women sort of uh, their places in the home and in, in, in running the family. And so the, the ministers for the Nation of Islam um, have given, historically, for, for 40 or 50 years, have given th uh, sermons to three different audiences, all male audiences, all female audiences, and then uh, an audience comprised of both the men and the women. And Minister Farrakhan wanted to give a uh, a sermon or, or speech to an all-male audience um, and the city of Cleveland said that, that they couldn't allow that because it would be gender discrimination. Well we found out that the Billy Graham crusade had, had the, that same year been allowed to rent public hall, the very same facility, to give uh, on one occasion an all-women speech and on another occasion an all-male speech. So, so the city's concerns about gender discrimination were conspicuously absent when a mainstream group like the Billy Graham Crusade wanted to have uh, their, uh, to rent the facility for their expressive purposes. So we brought suit and we were able to win. Uh, we got an injunction uh, from Judge White, a federal district court judge. The city did not appeal. Uh, and uh, that was front page news when we were able to get that injunction. But uh, again, the idea of, of the government sort of treating less favorably, less popular groups uh, when it comes to their expression, uh, that was something that was a theme in, in the kinds of First Amendment cases that we took. What was the name of that case? Uh, that was, let's see. That was either Farrakhan versus City of Cleveland or <laughs> Muhammad's Mosque number 18 versus City of Cleveland. I think that was the name of the case. Um, can you tell me about City of Seven Hills uh, versus Aryan Nations? Yeah, that, that was a great case. And I, I, that was a case where I got to work with uh, um, a guy named Ray Vasfari, who was later legal director for the Ohio ACLU. And I adore Ray. And we had a lot of fun. Uh, serving as, as co-counsel in a number of cases. Uh, and this was probably the most interesting case that he and I got to work on for the ACLU. Um, in this particular case, what was triggered was, well, the, the triggering event was the decision of the Israeli Supreme Court to release uh, a, an alleged uh, Nazi death camp guard, um, uh, John Demyanyuk, uh, they, they, they released him because uh, the prosecutors couldn't satisfy the incredibly difficult standard under, under Israeli law for um, the death penalty. They, they actually have an even higher standard than we do. Uh, we have beyond a reasonable doubt, and they have an even more exacting standard. So um, Demyanik was released from prison in Israel, and he was, the, the federal authorities in this country agreed to allow him to return to this country. And so he, uh, maybe return is the wrong word. I'm, I'm not sure if he had ever been in this country. I, I, he, he, I, think he, I think he was born in Poland, but for whatever reason, he had family here in Seven Hills, uh, Ohio. And so he was allowed to come to the United States and take up residence with his family in Seven Hills. Well, that decision was very controversial, and it caused um, a, well, a group of Holocaust survivors to want to protest outside his home. The U.S. Supreme Court in Frisbee versus Schultz had held that residential picketing is permissible, that the sidewalks in suburbia um, have the same First Amendment protections as the sidewalks here in downtown Cleveland. Uh, and so their desire to uh, protest on the sidewalk uh, in Demyanuk's neighborhood was consistent with their rights under the First Amendment. Um, and they came to the ACLU to vindicate their rights. The city of Seven Hills didn't want any residential uh, picketing. Uh, once the Ku Klux Klan heard about the the Holocaust survivors, the Ku Klux Klan, we didn't know they, they had, you know, any stake in this particular controversy. They wanted to provide a protest in support of Demyanyuk to advance a message of 
Holocaust revisionism, you know, the idea the Holocaust didn't occur. So, and, and then when the Holocaust survivors heard about that, that just doubled their desire to be able to protest. So ultimately this, this huge kind of mess of a situation involved the, the, the novel question of a right to engage in counter demonstration. So if the, if the Ku Klux Klan is protesting um, in front of Demyanyuk's house, can the Holocaust survivors take up position across the street to engage in a silent counter demonstration? Just their physical presence is a contradiction of the message of Holocaust revisionism. And so this big messy case ultimately boiled down to this very interesting question. Uh, there, there were cases involving counter demonstration, but Ray and I were not able to find any cases in which the, a, a court had been asked specifically whether there was a First Amendment right to engage in counter demonstration. And so that was sort of the novel First Amendment issue that uh, was posed in the case. Um, the city of Seven Hills thereupon sued everyone in sight. All the people who wanted to protest were sued by the city of Seven Hills, including the Aryan nations. They had some Idaho address for them. They, they never did actually show up. I, I don't know why they sued them. But in any event, um, this crazy circus of a case winds up being tried in front of uh, uh, the wonderful uh, state court judge, Daniel Gall. Um, and Judge Gall did a fantastic job of sort of taming uh, the confusion and uh, presided over a very orderly and interesting trial. Uh, this was an injunction case, so there was no jury. Uh, it was tried to the bench. And one of the most interesting things that happened was that uh, the Ku Klux Klan uh, were subpoenaed to appear, and we were able to cross-examine them. And on cross-examination, I was uh, able to get them to acknowledge that um, it, that they would not engage in violence uh, against the Holocaust survivors, that that was not their aim, uh, that in fact they wanted to avoid that because it was, for some reason, this was the, I, I never knew the Klan actually cared about their image, <laughs> but, but they, they seemed to be interested in not, you know, tarnishing their image by, by being on television attacking aged Holocaust survivors. So they said, look, you know, we're, we're not going to be attacking any Holocaust survivors. We just want to be in front of Demyandek's house and protest. And, you know, if the Holocaust survivors are on, on the other side of the street, well, we're not going to come after them. We just, we just want to be there and express our ideas. So we made a factual record in which there really wasn't any indication of the prospect for violence. And absent uh, the, an imminent likelihood of violence, there was really no reason for the kind of injunction that the city of Seven Hills wanted, which was essentially to prevent all protests from occurring. So Judge Gall fashioned an injunction that allowed the, the parties to take turns protesting, but he refused to allow simultaneous protests demonstration and counter demonstration. And so that was the posture of the case as it went up to the Ohio Supreme Court. And we, we got, uh, Ray handled the oral argument uh, in front of the Ohio Supreme Court and he was brilliant. And uh, we managed to get a victory, uh, a wonderful, wonderful decision, uh, City of Seven Hills versus, I can't think of, uh, let's see, what was the, Oh, for Aryan Nation, which is ironic because Aryan Nations, they, they never showed up, you know, but, but yeah, so the name of the case is City of Seven Hills versus Aryan Nation. And um, it's a wonderful case that stands for the proposition that there is actually protection for counter demonstration in the absence of some imminent likelihood of, you know, of a violent clash. So it's a fabulous opinion written by a Republican Chief Justice, good old Judge, good old Justice Moyer, very reasonable jurist wrote a beautiful opinion, uh, and it's something that, uh, that Ray and I were really happy to be able to win for the ACLU. That's a really interesting case. It was, it was fun. It was fun. <laughs> there was also, well, I mean, it, it, was, it was quite a circus. There was, this, there was this incredibly learned, articulate rabbi from New York uh, named Avi Weiss, who flew in and he wanted to sort of lead the, the Holocaust survivors and he was a very, very interesting figure. Um, and um, uh, 
attracted a lot of attention himself. So there, were, there were New York news media coming in uh, because of Avi Weiss. But uh, Avi Weiss paid uh, Ray and I in the ACLU the ultimate compliment. He said uh, that we knew First Amendment law the way he knows the Torah. <laughs> so I thought, what? Well, there's a compliment, you know. <laughs> so that, it, it, was, it was a fun case, though. Yeah. Okay, so you were involved in filing an amicus brief in Wisconsin v. Mitchell um, that disagreed with ACLU National. Can you recall the specifics of this disagreement? Yeah, it was it was basically, um, and I thought National was really very, they were they were pretty good about it. Um, they they weren't unpleasant about it. I mean, I'm sure they weren't happy with it. Uh, but but the basic idea, if if I can reduce the case to its to its you know to to the issue, um, we were concerned about. Um, a Wisconsin statute that imposed additional punishment. If a person committed a crime, they would be subject to the statutory punishment for that crime. But if they chose their victim um, as a result of some biased or bigoted viewpoint, there would be an additional punishment added on. And from the perspective of the Ohio ACLU and its board of directors, um, we all thought that the danger of a statute like that is that the extra punishment is essentially a thought crime. You're being punished for the physical act of committing the crime. So the extra punishment is not the result of any particular act, but is only based on having a biased or bigoted viewpoint. And so because it smacked of being a thought crime, we thought that it was important to, uh, to challenge it. And the, the national ACLU, I think, was, was, I don't want to say anything unflattering about them, but, but, but sometimes they were a little more interested in um, arriving at a liberal as opposed to a civil libertarian um, outcome or, or approach. And I think this, is, this was one of those cases where I think their liberalism got in the way of their civil libertarianism. Uh, I mean, one of the tough things about being a civil libertarian is that you wind up siding with very ugly and unpopular uh, people. Um, I mean, we've just been talking about Louis Farrakhan, who had all kinds of horrible anti-Semitic things to say. My mom is Jewish, so she, she wasn't all that happy about my Farrakhan case. Uh, but, you know, when, when you see people being treated differently by the government because of their unpopular views, I think that's why we, one of the reasons we have an ACLU is, is that, you know, we're supposed to be a government watchdog that is designed to prevent the government from discriminating on the basis of viewpoint. Uh, treating some citizens uh, more harshly than others. Uh, and so we thought that as, from a civil libertarian standpoint, which should be the ACLU standpoint, that was the right approach in Wisconsin versus Mitchell. So ACLU National was supporting this statute? They were. And uh, the Supreme Court ruled against us and in favor of, of the National ACLU. Um, uh, but I, I still think that we were right about that. But, you know, th I think one, one important thing is you can, you can disagree without getting unpleasant or ugly. And we were, we were always um, very, very solicitous of, uh, of, of the views of the National ACLU. We were never unpleasant in advancing our own. Uh, but uh, we did take the somewhat unusual step of filing an amicus brief on the other side of the National ACLU. Uh, but that was not, that was something that the board of directors was on board with, Chris Link was on board with, and, you know, the, the staff lawyers were on board with, so it was, uh, and we didn't, it was not something that we did lightly. I mean, we, we thought carefully about it and just thought, you know, this is, this is the, the right approach and the Supreme Court should hear, that's the whole purpose of an amicus brief, is just to sort of, you know, present a particular idea or point of view to the court. That idea, we didn't think, was being very adequately presented to the court, and that was the reason that we wanted to do it. Did you guys also decide to participate in this case? Because it was a Wisconsin case. Did you, was it for a local interest, I guess, something that was... Yeah, there, there was a similar, I, I believe there was legislation in Ohio uh, that was essentially identical. And I think I even debated uh, then Attorney General Lee Fisher um, uh, over that same kind of thing. Um, 
So yeah, there was it was something that was sort of sweeping the states. This this idea, and we just thought, you know, boy, this sure this sure looks like a thought crime to us. Yeah, I think the legal dockets at ACO, you mentioned a case State v. Wyant. Sure, that was the Ohio variant. Yeah, yeah, S same issue. So the ruling in the Supreme Court would have kind of helped decide that case. Is that That's right. To the extent that it's a federal constitutional question, the Supreme Court has the final word, mm -hmm. and. Uh, that's the reason that we were interested in state constitutional claims, too, because the Supreme Court can't decide state constitutional issues. So that's why we, we still think it's always wise, uh, in most cases, to add a state constitutional claim. Um, uh, because uh, the, the difficult thing is persuading the Ohio courts that they actually have the independence to decide cases uh, independently on state constitutional grounds. Some states are much more adventurous than others in terms of um, exploring um, their state constitution. So in California, in New Jersey, in Oregon, uh, you have a, a willingness on the part of the, of the state Supreme Court to really sort of put some teeth into their state constitutional provisions. Are there any other cases of significance that you want to talk about? Well, let me think. Oh, well, I, I think, you know, one of my all-time favorite cases that I did for the ACLU was Treesh versus Taft. That's the so-called last words case. Well, you mentioned that one. Do you want to talk about that one in more detail? Yeah, that, well, that one was fascinating. And that, that's another of these cases that literally there is no precedent. And, and it, it, I'm sorry that we were not able to set a legal precedent because this, the, the state of Ohio just stopped fighting. And so they, when they backed down, we had to enter into a settlement. You can't keep pushing. <laughs> you have to have two sides to a dispute. And if, if the government gives up, then you're done. And so we never, we never did manage to establish the precedent. But well, I can tell you about uh, Trish versus Taft. It was a case that involved um, an effort by a Republican governor, uh, must have been Taft, shortly after he entered office in the late 90s, he, uh, he came up with this idea where we needed to stop uh, death row inmates from giving the traditional last dying speech in the seconds before their execution. And the reason that he came up with this is that there have been, on very, very rare occasions, some death row inmates who have said aggressive or unpleasant things uh, about the victim or the victim's family. This happened so infrequently that you can literally count the, the instances on one hand. The principal example that the state of Ohio cited wasn't even an execution. It was uh, something that happened in California at a different stage in the proceedings. Um, there's uh, a, a moment after a person has been convicted and before he's sentenced, uh, that's called the right of allocution. It's an ancient right. Um, it's actually as ancient as the, this, this traditional privilege of giving a last dying speech. But it happens in court. You've been convicted, you're about to be sentenced, and you've, we've all seen it. Before I uh, pronounce your sentence, do you care to make a statement? And so, you know, some horrible person um, who was convicted of murder in California said some horrible things about the victim. And so that one rather isolated instance in California, not at an execution. See, at the execution, they're so scared, they're not shooting their mouths off at, the, at, at that stage. But anyway, that rather isolated instance was the essentially the, the chief main justification for this new prison regulation. And so the new prison regulation was that if you want to give a dying speech, you, you, can't, you can't say it verbally. But you have to write it out six hours before the execution, and you have to give it to the warden. And after you're dead, the warden may read it, but the warden has the discretion to edit it, paraphrase it, cut it, or censor it all together. And so when you die, you never know whether your statement is going to be read faithfully by the warden or not. Now, I was interested in the history. I thought that the strongest argument 
uh, would be the long, long, long history in which uh, in Anglo-American culture, we have allowed people to give a last dying speech. And so the way I researched it was I went and looked at English law and it was really interesting to research. This was probably the most fascinating case that I've ever handled for the ACLU. Um, what, we, what we looked at were there are um, old reports of treason trials in England. Uh, and we actually have these books here in uh, uh, the, the rare books part of our law library. And these books are. Um, I think they were printed in the 19th century, and they contain reports going back to the 1200s and the 1300s. And they all involve cases in which a person was tried for treason. So you have um, the King versus Sir Walter Raleigh, 1603. You have uh, the Queen versus Mary, Queen of Scots. I mean, <laughs> and the and the and so. And the, the beauty of these reports is that they didn't just announce the law, they then described the execution. So you have these contemporary reports that are like eyewitness reports from the execution describing how the execution was conducted. And starting, and so what I did was I just started reading these cases further and further back. And so in the 1600s, everybody gets um, to give their a, a long, unedited, uninterrupted dying speech. 1500, it's happening. 1400s. I think I traced it back to like 1383 was the first case where a person was given a brief opportunity to give a last dying speech before they were executed. So if that's ha so when you think about our First Amendment, which is you know adopted in 1791, if this was common in England in the early 1600s, for example, the, the so-called uh, gunpowder plot, which was like 1606 maybe, um, early, early 1600s, it's absolutely established as, as a hard and fast tradition that everybody, no matter what their crime, uh, and all the treason crimes were you know, punishable with death, so that's the reason I was reading those. It, starting in the 1600s, actually the mid to late 1500s, it's an absolute tradition. You trace it to this side of the Atlantic, and we're doing the same thing in, as, as far back as the 1600s. So this is a long-standing tradition. Um, and so that was the, so it was basically a historical argument that we used. Um, and you know, the, the argument was, look, wh where do our rights come from? Most of our most sacred rights come from old, long-standing uh, traditions in which the government has acquiesced uh, in, in, in certain individual rights. And so that was the nature of the argument. So uh, we put together a fantastic injunction brief and uh, brought suit, and the, the, the state did not want to get anywhere near the First Amendment arguments. They tried to dismiss the case on procedural grounds, on the grounds that uh, we had not exhausted our remedies within the prison system. Um, and so for about, for about two years, we had a lot of uh, skirmishing. And finally, we defeated. It, it, one of these resulted in a, in a, a judicial opinion um, that sided with us, but it was a it was a it was a case involving the exhaustion of uh, of administrative remedies. It wasn't on the First Amendment grounds, but in any event, we we survived two motions to dismiss, and once we're poised to reach the First Amendment issue, the government gives up, and we were able to show them that the state of Texas, which is not exactly a bastion of liberalism, in fact, they are experts in putting people to death. Uh, and they, they have this macabre website, uh, which has every single person they've put to death since the 80s. What was his last meal? What was his name? What was his crime? What was his last meal? What were his last words? I mean, it's, 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 it's one hell of a website. I stayed up all night one night reading it, you know, and sort of typing in, you know, typing up like highlights from it. Um, they, they have a prison regulation where the warden is required as the last moment before the person receives lethal injection. In Texas, the warden is required to turn to 
the prisoner and say, do you have any last words? And there's no limitation on duration or content. So what we said to the state was, look, we're going to keep fighting unless you agree to, to this kind of settlement. And so the, 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 the government, with, with my participation, rewrote the prison regulations so that um, there was now a, an affirmative right on the part of all death row inmates to be able to speak with a microphone so that uh, their words are audible to the witnesses uh, on the other side of the, the glass. They're in, they're in this glass enclosed space. So they have a microphone so that the media witnesses and the other witnesses can hear their last words. Um, and you'll, what you'll find is that when these guys um, uh, and the occasional uh, women who are executed, they're, they're not shooting their mouths off. Many of them actually apologize to the victim's family. Sometimes they'll make a political statement, uh, but often they'll just lament a, 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 a wasted life. Um, and, uh, you know, on rare occasions, maybe 5% of the time, they'll criticize the prosecutor. Uh, but for the, some, will, some will protest their innocence, but a very, very small number. Um, but it's it's this ancient right, and we should respect it. You know, it's been around since, you know, <laughs> since the 14th century. Uh, so that was the result of that case was was a settlement in which we participated in the rewriting of the prison regulation that's used for executions in Ohio. That's a fascinating case. Yeah, that was it. Was fun. It was fun. So overall, how have the courts and the practice of constitutional law changed over time? Well, I think that the courts continue to be um, a, a very important source of relief from legislative and executive overreaching. Uh, unfortunately, we've got a federal judiciary that is loaded with conservative Republican appointees. And I've argued in front of those people in some of the cases that we've described, and they are they are not interested in uh, performing justice. They are uh, heat-seeking missiles. Uh, when you walk into uh, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit as an ACLU lawyer, and you get a Reagan appointee on the other side of the bench, that person is not there to do justice. That, that person is there to torpedo your case. Uh, and I've had that happen a number of times. Um, what I find interesting is that the state court judges uh, are usually more inclined to give you a fair shake when you're advancing civil liberties cases, which is so strange. You know, you, we always think of federal court as the as the last bastion for for civil liberties, uh, but uh, given the spate of Republican appointees and the way they've successfully blocked Democratic appointees, we've got a federal judiciary that's loaded with uh, very conservative judges who. Uh, I think many of them are result-oriented. And again, I'm speaking from personal experience. Um, for example, um, the, the case involving the licensing fee imposed on homeless and Nation of Islam street newspaper vendors. The most important fact in that case, and it was an undisputed fact, the, the city of Cleveland did not dispute that the $50 fee was unaffordable, unaffordable to the plaintiffs. That is a key fact in the district court decision that awards us an injunction. I go before the Sixth Circuit. I make sure that they understand that that's an undisputed fact. That fact nowhere appears in the Sixth Circuit decision. And that's a really good example of what I mean by a court that has identified an outcome that it wants to find, and it's going to turn a blind eye to any important facts that would cut the other way. They don't even mention it. They don't even deal with it and distinguish it or, or explain it away. They just ignore it. And that's not justice, and, and that's not an appropriate performance by um, any sort of judge. Uh, appointed or elected. Uh, but then you can look at the Seven Hills case. We, we have, you know, the, the crazy facts in that case. And you have a Republican Chief Justice who writes a, an eloquent opinion 
uh, that is truly obedient to existing precedent and comes out in, not just in our favor, but really writes a, an, eloquent, uh, an eloquent opinion protecting the right of, of counter-demonstration. Um, so I think that in, in many respects, uh, we, we may as civil libertarians be better off going into the state courts, even though those judges are for the most part elected and therefore may have to face uh, an unhappy public uh, when they seek re-election uh, to the extent that they are, you know, I mean, usually when the ACLU is asking a court to do something, we're often asking for an unpopular outcome. So you, so, you know, intuitively, you would think, well, you'd want to be in federal court where the judges don't have to face re-election. But ironically, I think some of, the, some of the most courageous decisions that we've been on the receiving end of have been uh, state court judges. So, you know, in my old age, I'm, in my old age I'm, not, I'm not sure which way to go. Do you go to state court? Do you go to federal court? Uh, but, but in my experience, the state court judges, uh, for the most part, have given us a fair shake. Are there significant events that have changed Americans or the court's views of civil liberties? Well, I think that I think the most important events are those that have occurred in the earlier history of the of the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, during the Warren Court years, during the years when Thurgood Marshall and and uh, and and Justice Brennan were on the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, they handed down some courageous and and far-sighted opinions that transformed uh, our political landscape, providing a, a truly meaningful uh, source of review uh, from executive and, and legislative overreaching. I, I will say one thing for some of the justices on the U.S. Supreme Court, even the conservatives, the Chief Justice Roberts, Justice Scalia, um, they are pretty good on the First Amendment. They are pretty protective of First Amendment rights, even when uh, you have an unpopular speaker. Uh, and I and I respect that because that's that's you know I th I think it may be unpalatable for many judges to rule in favor of uh, hateful uh, or. Uh, disgusting speech, but uh, the Supreme Court, even recently, has been very good in, in protecting uh, sp speech rights. Uh, when it comes to reproductive freedom, you know, we, we may have some problems. But and even even in even in uh, even though these have been close calls, the the fantastic developments uh, with regard to the uh, the treatment of of uh, gay men and lesbians. Um, We've had some remarkable decisions in the courts to protect them. I mean, that's that's been really inspiring. So I think the, I think the courts continue to be, you know, the 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 place that I look to for relief from, you know, sort of emotional legislation overreaching by the executive. I think the courts are still the, the place to go, uh, and if we can just somehow manage to get uh, a Republican-controlled Congress to approve uh, Democratic uh, appointments to the federal bench, we may be able to achieve better, better ideological balance uh, in, in the federal courts. But maybe I'm, maybe I'm biased. I'm, I'm a lawyer. I, I still think the, the, the courts are the, are, are, are th that, that's the place to go for protection um, uh, from the government. What kind of reputation did the ACLU have while you worked here, and has it changed over time? I think under the guidance of Christine Link, uh, the organization has just gotten more and more and more credible. Um, and I think that she's done a wonderful job of making the organization more visible and more participatory. What, what I mean is that, that it, is a more, it, it is, has become an increasingly welcoming organization, bringing more and more people in. You know, it's not just, uh, in the old days, it was pretty much just lawyers, you know, but uh, she's, she's opened the gates and young people and you know, a any, any educated or, or interested person uh, is, is welcome in, in, in the ACLU now and all these fantastic programs that uh, she puts on at the ACLU of Ohio. I, I think it's been great. One of the things that she and I tried to do when I was there uh, was to overcome the knee-jerk antipathy 
that most people used to feel and perhaps still do when they hear the syllables ACLU. Uh, and it was talk radio during our day where we were able to show that our, our orientation was as a government watchdog and a civil libertarian organization protecting the individual from abuses of power by the government. Um, a lot of people didn't have a clear picture of what the ACLU was. And so um, I remember going on talk radio and, you know, these were calling shows, you know, and, and, and you know, the, 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 the people who were doing the talk radio were saying, wait, what we have, we have the man you love to hate, Kevin O'Neill here from the ACLU. And people would call in and many of them would express astonishment at how reasonable our positions were once they were adequately explained. Um, and I think that at the end of the day, there is a strong current of civil liber libertarianism in the American public and that um, it, it's simply a question of educating the public about our, not just, not just our policies, but why, why we have a particular approach to an issue. And when they hear why, even if they disagree, uh, they'll often say, okay, you know, I can understand that. And, I, and, and they don't think of us as the, the boogeyman anymore. You know, they don't think of us as this sort of, um, well, I, I mean, I think there's people like Rush Limbaugh probably whip, with, with, with misinformation, they whip people into a frenzy against the ACLU. But, but, but if we have a chance to explain our views, uh, then I think a lot of people will, uh, even if they can't agree, They'll say, you know what? It's good that we have an organization that 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 serves as a government watchdog, um, and even if we may disagree on this particular issue, we understand where they're coming from. Um, and I think that um, that was true when I was there, and I think it's more true now. Uh, but I think that's that's the key for the future of the ACLU. It's just a question of educating the public about not just what our our positions are, but why? And there's a strong enough streak of civil libertarianism in most Americans that I, I think w where we're coming from will, will appeal to them in the long run. So do you think, you mentioned the knee-jerk reaction people had, do you think it's, it has improved over time? I, I think that it, it has improved, although to the extent that Rush Limbaugh and other uh, conservative talk hosts are out there, they're continuing the misinformation. And, and some of the extreme Republicans, you know, like um, um, uh, uh, Ms. Bachman, for example, you know, who, who was uh, in, in the Republican primaries, you know, some of those people are responsible for some misinformation about us. But uh, I think the ACLU has become more sophisticated over time in terms of getting its ideas out and presenting them in a way that's understandable to people. If people understand why we're approaching an issue a particular way, I think they're much more likely to be sympathetic. So related to that, how has the organization and its operation changed since you were involved? It's all thanks to Chris Link. Uh, it's, it, is, it is just a... I mean, it's just a better run, more intelligently run operation, and she, she just gets better and better and better. And I'm telling you something, uh, when I was there, you know, there were days we were worried about, you know, whether, whether we keep the electricity on. And through those days, Chris fought and found ways to, to keep us going, found financing for us. You know, she has the most difficult and the least glamorous position. And over her, her many years with the ACLU, she has done a wonderful job of putting the organization in a situation where we are uh, financially, uh, I think, in very good shape now. It's all thanks to her efforts. I think she doesn't get enough credit. You know, I, I worked with her for four years. We never had a single argument, not one in all the time we work together and I, I love her and I think she's the greatest and um, and she she deserves a lot of credit for uh, the, the very happy position that the ACLU, ACLU of Ohio finds itself in now. Yeah. So can you tell me about some other board members or staff members or volunteer attorneys that you've worked with? Uh, well the, my all-time favorite was Ray Basfari who, who I've already mentioned. Uh, I, I like to mention Bill Sachs who is a fantastic lawyer and was a staff counsel when I was there. Bill, Bill is, is a wonderful, hard-working, intelligent uh, civil libertarian 
Uh, he's a terrific lawyer, and he's another person who I think doesn't get enough credit for the, the work that he performed there. Um, Bill, Bill was such a pleasure to work with. He was fantastic. Um, <laughs> there's, there's one guy that I, I, I really I miss, and he's, he's no longer alive. It's Harvey Gittler. Uh, he, <laughs> that, that guy was such, such an interesting person. Uh, he, he was a great, great civil libertarian, uh, had a very good sense of humor, was utterly devoted to the organization, and uh, was, was, you know, really sort of our, well, I, I think we didn't have a, a very significant representation in the you know, west of Cleveland. Well, when you get to Toledo, then there's some really good people there, Harlan Brits. Uh, but uh, but Harvey was 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 really a very important person for us, uh, uh, representing uh, sort of the area west of, of Cleveland. You just mentioned Harlan Brits. Can you talk about him a little bit? He was a, he was a great lawyer and a great man, and uh, I was able to um, to work with him just briefly in some cases that uh, uh, came out of Toledo. Um, I can't remember the litigation now, but I remember meeting with him and I remember thinking that he was such a wise and kind person um, and he'd seen so much and because he had seen so much, his advice was, was very, very sound. Oh, well, and then there's my hero, David Goldberger. Uh, that's, that's that, that guy. He's um, one of the all-time great ACLU lawyers on a national basis and he was he was um, general counsel when I when I got my job at the ACLU and so I had the great great fortune uh, to be under his wing uh, when I started and David was a great and courageous lawyer absolutely fearless um, and he gave me the best advice that uh, anybody ever gave me. I remember, like on this, on my second day on the job, I was trying to kind of put together a filing system in my office, and he called me and asked me what I was doing. And I said, well, I'm trying to put together, you know, just trying to get my file sort of in order. And he said to me, "You should be out causing trouble." <laughs> and that was right. That was right. And, uh, and 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 that is what the legal director is supposed to be doing. You're supposed to be out in the world, seeing what's happening, putting your ear to the ground, and uh, trying to be intensely aware of governmental overreaching, uh, whether it's in Cleveland or any other part of the state. And that's the single best advice that uh, I ever received. Yeah. So while you were at the ACLU, what was your biggest accomplishment? Well, it, it might have been our victory in the homeless dumping case, um, because there you had a powerful mayor and a police department that were following what I thought was an utterly inhumane policy. And we stood up to them and we got them to stop. And uh, I feel good about that and I feel good. Every time Mr. Mungai comes into my office like yesterday, you know, I, I, I feel good all over again about it. Uh, when I see that he's doing well, that he has a job in his own apartment, uh, you know, that's, uh, that makes me feel good. Yeah, that's great. So do you feel your experience with the ACLU affected you in any significant way? Did your views or beliefs change? You know, I think it's made me a, a more humane person. I think it's made me uh, a person with a bigger heart. Um, and I think it taught me that there are certain fights that are worth fighting. I, I'm really not a very contentious person. You know, I, I'm, I'm happy in my office trying to make my evidence class better. <laughs> that's, what I, that's what I really enjoy uh, when I'm not with, you know, our, my, my wonderful students. Uh, so, you know, you know, rolling up the sleeves and, and fighting with the city of Cleveland is not really my preferred activity. <laughs> but, but, you know, I, I think I learned that there are certain fights that are worth fighting. And, um, um, well, you know, it's interesting. I, I, I mentioned at the very outset, you know, what are the criteria for taking, for the ACLU to take a case? You know, we have limited resources. What, what, what criteria do you use to, to say, well, we should take this case 
uh, over this other case. And the criteria that we used when I was there, the number one criterion that, that we used was this question. How openly is the government thumbing its nose at the Constitution? And the more overt, the more brazen the constitutional violation, like picking up human beings and dumping them at uh, the Brexville Metro Park when they've committed no crime, you know, and just doing that in broad daylight, uh, you know, the, the more brazen, the more open, the more openly they're thumbing their nose at the Constitution, the more we have to be willing to take the case. And uh, so since that was the number one, and then the, the second criterion that we used were how many people are affected, you know. Uh, but the number one criterion was how openly um, is the government thumbing its nose at the Constitution. And that's what taught me that there are certain fights that are worth fighting. And um, uh, even though I'm, I'm really not a contentious person, I'm happy to have waged those fights, uh, you know, holding the ACLU flag. So what have you been up to since leaving the ACLU of Ohio? Well, I've been very lucky uh, here at uh, Cleveland Marshall College of Law uh, to teach wonderful students. Um, and I've been teaching for, I think, 18 years now. And um, it's, it's been incredibly rewarding. I, I get a real, I get great, great um, satisfaction in seeing uh, young people learn and grow. It's it's, it's the thing that really, really makes me happy. Um, you know, it, it's not something that happens under a spotlight, you know. It, 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 it's, it's quiet little moments like when a student asks a question and I realize that he or she has taken a quantum leap in their understanding of something. Like, that's a nice moment for me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and that happens a lot around here because I'm lucky enough to teach students who are very hardworking, they're very bright, they want to be here, they want to be lawyers, and they want to go out there and make a difference in the world. And it's, it is a great privilege, and I mean privilege, I mean I'm lucky to have this job uh, to be able to work with those people. And uh, boy, talk about a labor of love. I've, I've really enjoyed uh, my time here, and I'm, you know, I, I want to I want to keep doing it. It's it's it it gives me great satisfaction.